Welcome back to another Bitcoin video addressing the energy usage of the Bitcoin network or more specifically of the Bitcoin miners. I've addressed this before but it led to some confusion and unanswered questions. In this video I will bring up all the points that I made before and more while going way more into depth. You can find the links to the reports and articles I quote in the video description. The first thing we need to talk about is the value of the Bitcoin network. Because if you believe that the Bitcoin network has no value, then of course the logical conclusion is that it wastes energy. Something that has no value but uses energy is wasting energy by definition. So if you are set on Bitcoin having no value, this video is rather pointless to you. This video is not meant to explain the value of the Bitcoin network to you. There are many others that achieve that goal. Now, for the rest of you that agree with me that a censorship-resistant global monetary network that can store value across time and space and is accessible to everyone without being controlled by someone does have value, let's continue. Before we can really look into how much energy the Bitcoin network uses and what types of energy it uses, we need to address the comparison between Bitcoin and the Visa network. The Visa network processes thousands of transactions per second while Bitcoin handles 7 transactions per second. This creates the perceived and often attacked imbalance that Bitcoin is extremely energy inefficient on a transaction basis and scaling the transactions to the level of Visa would result in Bitcoin needing way, way, way too much energy. But neither this comparison nor merging energy usage with the number of transactions makes a whole lot of sense. Let's address them in order. The difference, and it's a very important difference one needs to understand, is that Bitcoin offers final settlement while Visa does clearly not. Bitcoin is a complete self-contained monetary settlement system. Visa transactions are non-final credit transactions that rely on external underlying settlement rails. Visa relies on ACH, Fedwire, SWIFT, the global correspondent banking system, the Federal Reserve and of course the military and diplomatic strength of the US government to ensure all of the above are working smoothly. A much more fair comparison would be Visa versus the Lightning Network. Lightning is a layer 2 application of the Bitcoin network, just like Visa is an upper layer of the banking system. Millions of Lightning transactions can be settled within a single Bitcoin transaction over the blockchain with no additional energy expenditure. Suddenly, Visa is not winning anymore. Critics often jump in saying that Lightning is just a theoretical concept and might not even work, but Lightning actually works today, it's just not widely adopted yet. But to have one last fun comparison here to show you how Bitcoin is a base layer, the average Visa transaction value is about $46. The average Bitcoin transaction value is about $15,000. And the general misunderstanding is that the more transactions you make over the Bitcoin network, the more energy expenditure you have. But there is no correlation at all. Metrics like the per transaction energy cost are misleading because transactions themselves do not cost energy, nor does Bitcoin's CO2 footprint scale with transactional count. So how exactly does Bitcoin's energy expenditure scale and its CO2 footprint to the world? Through one simple metric, its price. The higher the price for Bitcoin, the higher the margin for miners, the more competitive the mining industry because new miners want to grab the margin. The higher competition leads to more energy expenditure of the network measured in the hash rate which raises the cost to mine a Bitcoin, which ultimately reduces the margins again. It's a dynamic equilibrium. More miners put more energy into the network to get the block reward, which is newly created Bitcoin every 10 minutes. The hash rate follows the price. And this makes sense, because the more value is stored in the network, the stronger its security needs to be. Hash power portrays the security of the network. So you can expect the energy consumption of the Bitcoin network to increase if Bitcoin's price keeps rising. However, there is a bit of a ceiling for how long this remains true. The block reward gets cut in half every 4 years and will be superseded by transaction fees gradually. But fees won't get too high, because users need to be willing to pay them. What this means is that there is less of an incentive in the future to mine Bitcoin, because of the lower block reward. The network will ultimately find a balance with hash power, transactions and transaction fees as the inputs. As 88% of all coins have been mined already, mining is structurally shrinking, not a growing industry. Thus, most of the minor expenditure and hence carbon outlay from Bitcoin is due to largely invariant coin issuance rather than any variable that's correlated to transactional intensity. This fact invalidates the energy cost of transaction metrics that critics like to promote. It is issuance that largely finances miners, not transactions. And because most coins have been issued already, Bitcoin's future carbon outlay is likely to shrink. If you really want to look at per transaction energy cost, compare Visa to Lightning. The economic density of a Bitcoin transaction is always increasing, batching, segwit, lightning, etc. 
As Bitcoin becomes more of a settlement network, each unit of energy is securing exponentially more and more economic value. It is also very hard to compare Bitcoin to the traditional banking system or gold mining, because Bitcoin is very open source and transparent in its metrics and the other systems are not. What's the energy usage of fiat to reach final settlement in the banking system? No idea, it's incredibly difficult to quantify or to reach even rough estimates. Also, assuming Bitcoin sucks out some of the monetary premium of gold and reducing gold more to its industrial and ornamental use, we would see less profitable gold mining and therefore less gold mining in general. Now let's look at some of the numbers of the Bitcoin energy consumption researched by the University of Cambridge. At the time of this video, Bitcoin sits at an annualized consumption of 100 terawatt hours. That's 0.6% of the global electricity consumption more than Argentina or Ukraine. That's a lot and it's probably gonna rise still. But to put this into perspective, China consumes 50 times as much energy and the US consumes 30 times as much energy. The amount of electricity consumed every year by always on but inactive home devices in the USA alone could power the Bitcoin network for 1.7 years. And the total world renewables production could power the Bitcoin network 47 times. Speaking of renewables, are they used in Bitcoin mining? Different studies showed different results. The 20-page CoinShares research from December 2019 suggests the following. Using a combination of estimates of global mining locations and regional renewables penetrations, we again calculate the Bitcoin mining industry to be heavily renewables driven. Our current approximate percentage of renewable power generation in the Bitcoin mining energy mix stands at 73%, around four times the global average. The third global crypto asset benchmarking study by the University of Cambridge published in September 2020 came to a different result. Similar to 2018, this year's survey data shows that a significant majority of hashers, 76%, use renewable energies as part of their energy mix. However, the share of renewables in hashers' total energy consumption remains at 39%. Hydropower takes the number one spot followed by coal and natural gas. One interesting factor the study states is that it doesn't infer how much of the natural gas would be otherwise wasted energy. USA have witnessed the installation of a few mining sites powered by stranded gas, such as in Texas or North Dakota. Can you, can you explain like step by step what your company does with that wasted or flared gas and how it turns into Bitcoin and what that gas would be doing if it wasn't being turned in and mined to Bitcoin? Yeah, so right now we're predominantly in the Bakken in North Dakota specifically. The way oil drilling works, like you, I, you IP a well, you drill a well, not only is oil coming out of the ground, but massive amounts of methane are coming out of the ground as well, natural gas. Methane is a very heavy greenhouse gas, so leaking of that into the atmosphere is something over time, 20 to 50 times worse, again, depending on your time scale for, for the atmosphere than just pure CO2. To attempt to reduce that effect on the atmosphere, what you'll find is a lot of these producers flare, so they'll bring out just a like huge flare stack and literally just light the gas on fire so it's not methane going up to the atmosphere. And said it's CO2, they combust it. Like at least it's not methane. We're we're putting CO2 up there. But so what we do is we say, hey, we're gonna help you out in, in in a couple ways here. Instead of flaring that gas, cost you money. It's a drag on your balance sheet. Costly from a regulatory perspective, you can only flare so much before you have to shut down your oil production. We'll take that gas instead of piping it to a flare stack, uh, redirect the the, the pipes to our EPA certified generator. We'll run it through there, and that'll combust the methane with 99.99% efficiency into CO2. And then as a benefit on the back end, we're gonna we're gonna use that to power our Bitcoin miners, which are which are gonna be able to get you a, a positive res revenue stream and an alternative revenue stream that's driven by uh, demand factors that are completely separate from your core business, which is getting oil and gas to market. Um, so depending on uh, where the wells are, whether or not uh, they have the ability to connect to a pipeline to deliver that gas to market, whether or not the pipelines even have capacity, uh, even if they are available, sometimes there isn't enough capacity to get uh, the gas into the pipeline to get it to the midstream provider and eventually the market. Um, so we come in and say, hey, we're going to bring the market to the molecule instead of you trying to figure out uh, how to get this to market or to flare it. Uh, we're going to solve your problem by showing up and consuming it ourselves. And then we'll turn that into Bitcoin and we can do like a rev share. The idea of Bitcoin using wasted energy is not only applicable to natural gas, but even more so to hydropower. There are still multiple sources that do suggest that enormous amounts of hydropower is actually wasted every year. 
According to Reuters, citing the provincial governor Huang Shengfa, in Hunan province alone, 30 terawatt hours of hydropower is wasted every year. This is also what happens in the Sichuan province. Sichuan, second only in the hash power rankings to Xinjiang, is a province characterized by a massive overbuild of hydroelectric power in the last decade. Sichuan's installed hydro capacity is double what its power grid can support, leading to lots of curtailment or waste. It's an open secret that this otherwise wasted energy has been put to use mining Bitcoin. If your local energy cost is effectively zero but you cannot sell your energy anywhere, the existence of a global buyer for energy is a godsend. And overall, our findings reaffirm our view that Bitcoin mining is acting as a global electricity buyer of last resort and therefore tends to cluster around comparatively underutilized renewables infrastructure. This could help turn loss-making renewable projects profitable and in time, as the industry matures and settles as permanent in the public eye, could act as a driver of new renewables developments in locations that were previously uneconomical. And also, to give you the other side of the story, some areas, such as Iran, are dominated by natural gas, or, such as Kazakhstan, Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia, are dominated by coal and supplement with small amounts of wind or hydro. This is of course not what we would like to see. To look at another point, there are different cryptocurrencies that have a less intensive energy intake, but they have different drawbacks. It's very hard to optimize a cryptocurrency on all axes, including decentralization and security. Now, as already mentioned, the energy usage of the Bitcoin network will likely go higher first and cap or even slightly shrink at some point later on. And you heard me talk about all these different things and we can ultimately go back to the very beginning of the video. Because the only relevant question is, is it worth it? Can the energy consumption be justified by the value the network brings to people? I believe that the answer depends to some degree on how much you understand about Bitcoin and its applications. My answer is a clear yes. Just like a car uses more energy than a horse carriage, a washing machine uses more energy than hand washing, and computers use more energy than abacuses. All these disruptive inventions are worth it, and so is Bitcoin. At least that's my conclusion. I hope you took something out of this video, learned something from the things that I presented. Maybe you'll come to a different conclusion than I do, and that's okay. I mean, it's still a discussion, it's not like there's some ultimate truth in here or so. It really depends on how much value you think the Bitcoin network is going to provide to humanity. If you learned something from the video or enjoyed it, I hope you leave a like and subscribe to the channel for further content, and I see you next time.